Hi guys, this video is the first of a two part series on flying for Susia. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dan Richworth and I'm the author of Papa Kilo, a true story from a Susia pilot in Indonesia. I'm also a former pilot, instructor and manager from Susia. I've flown with Susia for four years and since leaving I'm now a Boeing 737 captain. So I'm in a fairly good position to offer advice to any aspiring pilots, especially for the low round guys who are trying to get their first job. So, there are two questions which people ask me all the time on social media. The first question is, what's it like flying for Suzy Air? And the second question is, how do I get a job with Suzy Air? Now, I'll go into the second question in my next video, and just for now, I'm going to focus on the first question. What's it like flying for Suzy Air? And the best way I can answer that question is by giving you five reasons why you may absolutely love flying for Suzy Air, and also five reasons why you may actually hate it. So the most obvious pro of working for Susia is that you're going to have endless adventures. You probably know this already, but it's worthwhile going over this in some more detail. So firstly, you're going to be landing in some of the most interesting airstrips in the world, some of which are quite literally sloped up the sides of mountains. Words cannot possibly explain just how exciting this is, especially when after you land, maybe you're greeted by local tribes armed with bows and arrows, it doesn't happen all the time and of course the excitement is going to vary a lot depending on where in Indonesia you're actually based and where it is you're flying to. Papua is probably the most interesting of all the regions to fly in, however other regions such as Timor, Kalimantan and Sumatra also have their own quirks as well. Whether it's flying over stunning coral reefs or having a fucking volcano erupt next to you as you're flying, there's always something interesting to see. And the adventure won't stop when you're on the ground either. If you're from a western background like myself, Indonesia in general is going to be completely different in regards to culture, climate and nature. Especially given that each place you go to is going to be completely different to all the others. Indonesia could be best described as maybe being a, a federation of smaller countries each one with their own language, history and natural wonders. You're going to meet lots of interesting people from all over the world and visit lots of interesting places. You're definitely not going to get bored, I can promise you that now. So needless to say, if you're flying a low altitude single engine aircraft around high terrain and thunderstorms which are so large that they breach the stratosphere, then of course there's going to be an element of danger. Again perhaps I'm stating the obvious here but it's really worth going over this in more detail. So the amount of danger that you're facing your job will depend a lot on where you fly, with the highlands in Papua being the most dangerous. Susie has had three fatal accidents in the past, two of which were sea fits or controlled flight into the terrain. I'm not going to go into too much detail regarding those accidents other than to say that the pilots involved were both good aviators and more importantly good people with families back home. The training has improved a fair bit in Susie since the accident, but ultimately when you're flying Landing especially around high terrain, of course there is going to be a very large risk. Usually in commercial aviation, a pilot will need to make a series of mistakes in order for a serious incident or accident to occur. However, there will be times when you're flying in Indonesia, especially when you're flying to mountain strips with committal points, that is when you haven't got an option to go around due to the high terrain, that just one single mistake can potentially kill yourself and all of the occupants in your aircraft and that is something which is worth thinking about. Even when you're on the ground in Indonesia, you're still going to be exposed to far more danger than you would do back home. There isn't exactly a shortage of serious illnesses that you can contract in Indonesia such as malaria 
and even worse, dengue fever. Contracting these illnesses can potentially kill you. Best case scenario, your liver's going to have permanent damage. The term what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger, that doesn't really apply here because the second time you contract these illnesses, it's always going to be worse than the first time because your liver is already damaged. And if you've been unlucky enough to catch malaria or dengue fever twice whilst in Indonesia, frankly, you better just go home. Don't go back to the tropics. It's, it's not worth it. It's not worth risking your health. You also need to think about other things such as potentially tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, even civil uprisings. There's also a lack of emergency health care, etc., etc. Now, most of us, we don't have to worry so much about these things back home. However, in Indonesia, these are, of course, things which you always need to think about. In regards to the roster, Susie Apal is really our sport, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. The roster depends on your base, however, worst case scenario, in Sumatra and Jakarta, you'll be working three weeks on and one week off. With the best case scenario in Papua, you're going to be getting four weeks on and two weeks off. You also get 28 days of annual holiday each year. So if you're smart, you can actually split up those 28 days of annual holiday and mix them up with the rostered one or two weeks off so that you can have plenty of time to explore other parts of Asia or even just visit home. When you get a job with Susia, they'll sponsor your visa. However, that's just your visa. Unless you can find another way to obtain a visa for your wife, girlfriend or kids, then they'll need to stay at home. And even if you could get around the issues with the visas, just bear in mind for the first year or so, you're going to be a first officer. And that means that Susie will regularly change your roster from base to base, so you won't be in one fixed location. And even when you do get your captaincy and you have a permanent base, just remember you're going to be staying in company accommodation. There are of course options for you to get your own accommodation, however just remember you can only rent or lease that property. Only Indonesian citizens have a right to buy property in Indonesia. And even then, accommodation is rarely good quality in most places in Indonesia. For kids especially, life is not going to be easy. If you're based in Jakarta and don't mind the pollution, there's always the option for private international schools for your kids. But elsewhere, forget it. Indonesia is a great place to take your family on holiday, however not so much for them to live long term. Also you need to be realistic in regards to long distance relationships. Is it really going to work long term? Because personally, based on what I've seen from some of my colleagues, it simply doesn't work much longer than six months. Now again, it's something which you really do need to think about. Accommodation, transport, food and tax is all paid for by Susia. You may not get paid much when you first join Susia as a first officer with a starting salary around about 900 US dollars a month. However, you'll have no expenses. So with this disposable income, together with all the time off you get, you can afford to have some amazing holidays. I mean really amazing. Internal flights in Indonesia are fairly cheap and there isn't exactly a shortage of places to explore either. If you love scuba diving and snorkeling like I do, Komodo Islands, Raja Ampat and Giliyans are amongst some of the most popular destinations. You also have hundreds of mountains to climb, jungles to explore, or you may just want to go to Bali, chill in the swimming pool with a beer, whatever. You can even go swimming with sharks if you want. If you're ever feeling lost for ideas of where to explore or things to do, just remember you also have 150 other colleagues flying for Susia who you can ask. I've seen some pilots travel to some pretty weird and wonderful destinations. The company accommodation 
accommodation in Susie varies a lot. The accommodation tends to be much better in the more remote locations. For example, in the bases in Papua, you can expect a fairly large clean room, which usually has its own ensuite bathroom. So it's actually quite nice. In Jakarta, however, in a place called Patri Apartments, you'll be lucky to be allocated a bed which isn't infested with your previous colleague's pubic hair. I'm not even joking. The shower room is normally flooded because the drain's clogged. You certainly wouldn't want to touch anywhere on the floor with your bare feet or touch anything with your hands for that matter. I don't want to go into too many details here, but you get the point. Now, you can of course mitigate some of these problems by cleaning the place yourself. If you're permanent there, that makes sense. However, if you're only staying in that room for a few days and you've just spent the whole day flying, it's perhaps understandable that you don't want to spend uh, an hour or so cleaning up someone else's mess. It's gross, I know. In regards to the food, again, it varies a lot. Usually in the more remote locations, the food is quite good, which is just as well because it's not like you can just go out and, and eat in a restaurant. However, in some other places, the food is inedible. And if you're vegetarian, forget it. You need to just eat what you're given or you starve. I hate sound blunt, but that's just how it is. I was vegetarian myself before I joined Susia. So yes, I understand the ethical arguments against eating meat, etc, etc. But I'm afraid to say it's not going to work. In the four years that I've been with Susia, I've only ever met one pilot who actually stuck to a vegetarian diet and he must have weighed about 120 pounds. He rarely ate at all. He just couldn't. I mean, you, you really need to put your health first here. You can't afford to be too fussy when it comes to food or you just won't eat. It's harsh, but that's the reality of it. Usually when you fly for an airline, you'll be given a very comprehensive training and strict standard operating procedures which you have to follow. This works pretty well for most airlines flying to large airports. However, when you're bush flying, you need to be a bit more flexible. There's an endless list of different scenarios that you might encounter for which you have absolutely no training for. And this forces you to really think about what it is that you're doing and also why. You're not just blindly following some procedure, you really need to think outside of the box. Now air traffic control are a particular hazard in Indonesia. And I can tell you right now that if I blindly followed ATC instructions during my time with Susia, I would have died several times over by now. Traffic, traffic. I've lost count of the number of times that we've been vetted towards high terrain or towards other aircraft. You really do need to watch and listen very carefully to what the other aircraft are doing. And as a result of this, your situational awareness improves a lot. As well as this, your position will also improve a lot. When you fly a large aircraft like a 737 for example, it's important that you always touch down on the markers when you land, because if you don't, you can ultimately overshoot. While the same is also true when you're flying a caravan to a very short landing strip, you need to be precise, you need to land right at the beginning of the runway because if you don't then of course you're going to overshoot. So in general your aircraft handling skills are going to improve, your situation awareness will also improve and your resilience, that is your ability to deal with a situation which is outside of the scope of your training will also improve. goes without saying that you certainly don't want to be breaking the rules when you're flying if you can help it. However, there will be occasions, especially in bush flying, where breaking the rules is the safest course of action. To give you an example, and this happens a lot, you can't legally fly a single engine aircraft under IFR, that is instrument flight rules, in Indonesia when you're carrying commercial passengers. It's not just Indonesia, this also applies to many other countries as well. The reason for this is in case of an engine failure, because of course you've only got one engine. If you have an engine failure, 
Ideally, the pilots need to be able to look outside, they need to be able to visually look for a place to land. So the rule for a single engine aircraft to avoid flying through cloud, it makes sense, at least most of the time. However, the Caravan has one of the most reliable engines in the world, which is the PT-6 engine. Now the PT-6 is incredibly unlikely to fail. Engine failures just aren't a major threat in our particular operation. However, what is a major threat in our operation is high terrain. Now rather than duck down beneath the cloud and risk striking the numerous hills and mountains below, it's far safer for us to climb above the minimum safe altitude, even if it means flying through cloud. If you join Susie here, you too will need to break this rule on a regular basis. However, you need to break that rule for safety. There are some other rules that you may be pushed into breaking, and this applies to any bush flying operator anywhere in the world. It's up to you to decide where the line is. However, what's important is that you always put safety first. And the four years that I've flown with Susia, I can honestly say I've only ever intentionally broken the rules for reasons of safety, nothing else. Now this is perhaps a spin-off from reason 4, it will make you a better pilot. However, these new skills which you've learned from flying for Susie Air won't just make you a better pilot, they'll also make you more desirable to the airline industry. With the exception of a few, the majority of bush pilots will eventually become airline pilots. The airlines already know full well that bush pilots are great when it comes to general handling, decision making and situational awareness. You'll be building hours whilst at the same time staying current. The biggest pitfall of any pilot fresh out of flying school is not flying on a regular basis. Each airline has their own recruitment policy, however as a general rule most airlines expect you to have flown at least 50 hours in the previous 6 months. With Susia you can be flying around 6 to 700 hours per year. Now as previously mentioned, you won't have any living expenses whilst you're flying for Susie Air. Although the first officer pay starts off fairly basic, captains can earn anywhere from 2,400 to 3,800 US dollars per month, with instructors and managers earning considerably more. With all the money you can save from your time at Susie Air, you can actually afford to invest some of that money with further training and relocation. These are the two major costs when it comes to getting a job with many airlines. What's more, pretty much every airline manager in the world has heard of Susie Air. After the documentary Worst Place to Be a Pilot, Susie Air is now famous. When you're competing against hundreds if not thousands of other applicants, having a niche such as former Susie Air captain written at the top of your CV is likely to get the attention of the recruitment personnel. Finally, and this is important to mention, corruption in Indonesia is fairly widespread. Transparency International have ranked Indonesia 89 out of 180 for corruption, with Somalia coming in at number 180. Sure, Indonesia isn't anywhere near as bad as a war zone when it comes to the authorities abusing their power, however it is still far away from having a standard of governance which is on par with that of a western liberal democracy, and especially as a foreigner, you're going to have limited rights. Now the corruption you may encounter can vary anywhere from taxi drivers ripping you off, which happens a lot as you can probably imagine, to the worst case scenario being extorted for money, from the police or immigration authorities. Fortunately I've experienced the latter myself, however it has happened to some of my other colleagues. This corruption also exists in Susia as a company. For example, when you're offered a job at Susia, like most jobs, you're going to be given an employment contract. However, I can tell you right now, this contract will mean very little. If for example the management decides to give you a pay cut, then they're going to give you a pay cut, regardless of what it says in the terms of the contract. It happened back in 2015, shortly before I left the company, 
and uh, good luck trying to sue them because ultimately you're on their visa. They could potentially have you deported. Now that said, just in the interest of balance, the senior management have only breached the terms of our contracts on a few occasions in the past. At least in the four years that I was there, this certainly wasn't commonplace. However, as a large company hiring a foreign national, especially with Susie's personal political power, they're ultimately going to have an enormous amount of power over you. And that's something which is certainly worth thinking about. So is Susie Air right for you? Well, in the short term, providing they don't have a partner and kids to worry about, then yes, maybe. But I would certainly emphasize the part about the short term. It's a great adventure and personally, I'm glad I did it. However, on the flip side of that, I'm also glad that I left when I did. I personally couldn't see myself settling down and raising a family in Indonesia. I appreciate that some of my colleagues have done exactly that. However, for me personally, four years was enough. Ultimately though, you need to decide for yourself whether or not the Suzier life is for you. I hope the information in this video has been useful for you. If you would like to know more about what it's like flying for Suzia, please do consider buying my book, Papa Kilo. Part one is already available from Amazon. I'm currently working on part two. If you think the Suzier might be for you, then please also watch my next video, how to get a job with Suzier. I'm uploading it very shortly. Thanks for watching.